Excellent. So uh, I will introduce tonight's lecture. So our lecture tonight is the importance of having a favourite dinosaur. Welcome to the paediatric ward um, from Dr. Manny Jayamurthy. Um, Dr. Jayamurthy graduated from BSMS in 2017 and is currently a paediatric trainee in London. Uh, so with, without further ado, I'm going to hand over uh, to, to Manny. OK. Hello, everyone. Great to see so many of you here. Uh, and I know it's, it's a quite miserable month. Um, looking out the window and it's very rainy so it's really nice to uh, have you all join me today so we can have a chat about pediatrics and uh, and a little bit about how things work in medicine um, why we do the things we do um, uh, on on a ward round and we'll talk about that a little bit more um, and we'll go from there um, I just want to say off the bat this is going to be a very interactive session so I need lots and lots of input from you and I'll show you how we're going to do that as we start. All right, let me start sharing my screens. So that and that. Perfect. Good. So you should all be seeing uh, what I'm seeing, which is uh, my little splash page, the importance of having a favorite dinosaur. Welcome to the pediatric world. And the reason I chose this uh, title is because there is, you know, we, we're all doctors in a hospital generally, but there isn't that many, there aren't that many other aspects of uh, medicine where it's really important to have those things like a favorite dinosaur and a favorite tv show and we're going to talk a bit about why later on uh, what we mean by the pediatric ward is uh, the specialty where we work with children and this is babies including premature babies so babies born before uh, sort of 37 weeks which you know uh, which is uh, before we usually expect babies to be born um, and up to the age of 18, so, you know, adults. So that whole span of childhood we cover. Uh, great. So but what about me? Who am I? Well, uh, my name is Manny, as, as Zach uh, introduced me. I'm, uh, one of the, I'm one of the doctors. Um, I trained at Brighton Southwark Medical School and I graduated in 2017. I started in 2012. Um, I hopefully you uh, all have a bit of an understanding about what uh, medical training is, but the first two years are called Foundation Year One and Foundation Year Two, and I uh, did that on the South Coast in Brighton and also in Eastbourne um, and Hastings. Um, I then took two years out. You don't necessarily have to keep progressing on the ladder of medicine, so I decided to do a bit of uh, a couple of things that I really wanted to do first, which was explore pediatrics and. So I got a job uh, just doing a bit of pediatrics for a year. And then I got a job doing teaching for a year te and it was teaching medical students, um, which was incredibly fun. Um, and then I decided I do, did want to continue and do training as per uh, the sort of pathway in medicine. Uh, and I'm now a pediatric trainee in South London, who has been on strike today. I'm sure uh, you may have seen it in the, in the news. So what can you expect from this talk? Well, it's hopefully it's going to be a very fun, interactive session. Um, we're going to try and gain an understanding of how a day in pediatrics works. And I think to some extent, you can extend this to the whole of medicine. But in particular, I'm trying to think about things that are common and uncommon in pediatrics. Appreciate some of the skills that we use in pediatrics that you might you may not use elsewhere. And understand, I really sort of want you to understand how this might be used in your application to medical school and how you can use that information to sort of help reflect on things that, you know, in work experience in, uh, or in, at interviews and things. So hopefully you find a bit of this useful for that. So as I say, interactive, very interactive. Um, we're, how are we going to be interactive? Well, I've got this code here. So hope if you all have a device, um, so scan the QR code or you go to menti.com and use that code right there. Great, so I am going to now flip over to the other screen. Ooh, hopefully that's helped. Great. Um, and I am just looking to see where you're all from. So where are you joining us from today? We've got a huge number coming from Southampton. It, that's very interesting, I wouldn't have thought that. Um, Eastbourne, Brighton, all on South. Very South Coast heavy at the moment, really. Um, and Brighton, of course, um, you, whoa everywhere it's moving so quickly i can't i can't even want to stabilize it maybe uh toronto hello kent we've got hastings cambridge manchester brilliant liverpool some big cities all across the uk that is fantastic north london 
and London, of course. Brilliant, brilliant. And a couple of uh, international people as well. So amazing to see all these responses. Um, there are still some coming in. Someone's at home. That's fair enough. That is an answer. Uh, yeah, perfect. Great. Uh, and this just helps show that, you know, there is uh, a broad range of you. Um, and that's fantastic to see. Now, next up is ooh, about you. So we're going to start by talking about what is a water. Let's keep it, keep it too early there. Right. Uh, and I don't know if you've heard of the term water round, but I just want to see, you know, if you have, tell me what you think it is. Uh, you know, and we'll talk a bit more about it. And this will be useful for you when you come around to it. But what, what is a water round? Um, this is one where you have to type in an answer. So, uh, and might take a little bit of time for some of the answers to come up. But what we're going to do is just have a discussion about what is a water round. Um, going around each one to find specific one you enjoy the most. Interesting, yeah. Visit a ward where a doctor goes and checks in the patients, review their care, checking in on patients on a ward. Yeah, perfect. When check patients checks with all the patients in a ward. Perfect. I'm reading through these. Uh, amazing. Lots of very different responses here. Uh, but I'm seeing two main things going on here. One, which is people saying that it's checking in on patients, um, seeing how they're feeling and getting updates. Um, and others saying it's a designated time for training or uh, uh, going around and seeing different wards till you find what, what your favorite is. Um, so that those, and I think those are, those are the two main camps I'm getting, uh, of these. So, uh, the reason I introduced this question is because it's actually really fundamental to how medical teams and things work, um, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, let me just read some more of these. I think that's, yeah, that's exactly where they sort of lie at the moment. So, uh, let me go back to my previous screen Ooh, and we can see. What is a ward round? The ward round is, and so it's very much what the second camp of people are saying, which is that the medical team uh, or part of the team go around the ward and see patients who are currently on the ward. So it's a ward round. Um, and the people on the ward round might be a senior person, like a consultant or registrar, um, some other doctors who will be there to help with the notes or uh, look up information that the senior doctors want or information that you know that you want to give to the senior doctors. That could be uh, foundation year two doctors, pediatric trainees or GP trainees. I've been focusing on the pediatric ward, but in other specialties like um, uh, acute medicine or surgery, this might be surgical trainees and medical trainees and so on. Um, you, you will also have nurses uh, who are, you know, nurses in charge might be joining the ward round and particularly in pediatrics, the nurse in charge often joins the ward round. Um, and sometimes the nurse who's looking after that specific patient who you've gone to do the ward round on might also join the ward round. And, you know, especially in a teaching hospital, which, and but most hospitals, you might have medical students who are there as well. Now, we've talked about what of what this and and to the other camp of people who are saying you know is it where you go around till you find the specialty you like that's that's rotation so that's rotational medicine um which is how we sort of do the first couple of years of being a doctor you rotate around different um wards and things until you have uh you know cho you've chosen your specialty and even after you've chosen a specialty you do within you know some specialties within your specialty but we can come on to that in the q a at the end uh, let me just see. Perfect. Uh, oh, and someone said, what do, do the nurse in charge mainly do? Well, they're in charge of the ward, really. You know, us doctors are, um, we sort of have plans and we do uh, things for patients, uh, but ultimately coordinating the flow of uh, the ward and everything comes from the nurse in charge. And they've also got staffing numbers of nurses. They do an awful lot of things, some, some which I don't even know, really. Um, great. So, going on now we've said what a ward round is but what why do we do them I mean, what's the purpose of this and you know we're i i my talk is you know well, welcome to pediatric ward and i've gone straight in on the ward round uh and asked you what it is and but i now want to know you know why am i focusing on it? why do we do these ward rounds what is it about them that is you know important enough for me to tell you about it uh to ensure patients are happy and improving, at least not worsening. Yeah, definitely. Uh, 
to make sure that everyone has the care and everyone's kept, kept updated perfect to ratio patients feedback. These are amazing answers. Checking up on patients, emotional state of patients, yeah. In order to getting doctors used to talking to patients, absolutely. So there are lots of different elements to it. That's a really good one that I hadn't actually thought up in for my slide. So that is absolutely true, which is to help doctors getting uh, get used to patients, communicate with them and staff. Um, and I'm seeing lots of answers here about confirming diagnoses and to check on progress and check on the patients and check if the treatment's working. This is exactly right. To plan the medical care. These are, guys, these are amazing answer. Um, to make sure patients have received cares from all sides of health system. So a bit of coordination of care can happen reward and absolutely. Um, get an understanding of the patient progress. Perfect. So these are very, very pertinent answers. So that, that's brilliant. Absolutely. What you've said here is, well, I'm going to show you on my next slide, is, ooh, why do we do ward rounds? It's to see the patients. And what, we, what I mean by see the patients is what some of you have said, which is, you know, you go to physically see them if, in most ward rounds, but there are some ward rounds where you might do a virtual, um, sort of a, a virtual ward round, which is what we're going to do today. Um, or a notes ward round where you sort of look through their notes and numbers and things. Um, but really, you know, and why are we doing all of that? Well, is to consider the reason they're, they're in hospital, monitor their progress. And really the questions we're asking ourselves is, have they improved? Have they deteriorated, got worse? Are there any new issues? Also, are there, is there any new information? Um, this could be, you know, that the patient's observations, the vital signs, heart rate, uh, breathing rate, their level of oxygen saturations, have they changed in any way? In, for the better or for the worse, what are the blood test results? Um, what are, what's the imaging like? You know, chest X-rays, CT scans, MRIs. Did we order one? What happened to that scan? What do we see on it? Does that change what we're doing? Does that confirm our diagnosis? Does that refute our diagnosis? Does that change what we do? And that's what we're trying to do on the ward run. We're going to see the patients. We're going to make the plan for the day. And one of the things is that we review our old plans. And then we either keep going with our plan, make new plans, and then we enact the plans that we do. So one thing that I'd like us to think about is, you know, the, the ward round concept is something that happens throughout all of medicine in here, in, in America, Canada, India, wherever you go, you will there, there are ward rounds. Uh, and every specialty, pretty much does ward rounds. So um, surg surgeons do ward rounds and medical doctors do ward rounds and pediatricians do ward rounds and, uh, you know, almost everywhere, every bit of medicine, you will see a ward round. But I want us to think, as we go through our virtual ward round that we're doing today, how are the ward rounds going to be different in pediatrics when you work with kids and children? How, how are we going to do things differently? And what sorts of different skills are we going to need in pediatrics? Now, I know this is sort of jumping ahead for some of you, you know, if you haven't reflected on what skills you need in medicine in general, then to jump to what skills we have in pediatrics might be a bit of a step, but I'm really hoping that we can, you can use that to work backwards and go, okay, let me just think about all the skills I might need in medicine and what, and then highlight the ones that, you know, might be useful in pediatrics more so than in other specialties. Um, not saying that, and you know, in some specialties you need different skills to what we use. But I just want you to think about that as we go forward, and hopefully that'll help you reflect in, on whatever you do going forward in terms of work experience or whatever. Hopefully this will help you on on that journey. So I'm going to set the scene. What's happening? Well, you are a junior doctor in the pediatric department at a district general hospital. What I mean by district general hospital is that it's a local hospital rather than a children's hospital. So um, those of you call, uh, calling in from Liverpool, Manchester, they have, there are Sheffield, there are children's hospitals there, like Alderhey, Manchester Children's, Sheffield Children's. Um, and the district general is more like the local hospitals that you might go to when you are. I'm up. So you, you won't have all the pediatric specialties and things there, but in your hospital, you have a department who are able to look after kids. 
And when you get stuck, you have to ask the children's hospitals for their help. What's the other context? Well, you, we're going to start. We're going to start our ward round in a minute. Um, we have three patients on the ward. Realistically, in the middle of winter, your ward will be full, and that could be 18, 20, 24 patients, depending on how big your ward is. But we're in the interest of time and not to uh, you know, bore you too much, we're going to do three patients. But we have a three patient uh, ward and we have four patients waiting in a &E, uh, to be admitted to the ward. Uh, that's an unusual scenario, but I'm just trying to you know, up the ante a little bit there. Cool, so we are, you are a junior doctor. I am also a junior doctor, I guess, um, in this setting, uh, or I guess I'm your senior because I'm guiding you through it. Um, and we have come in in the morning, we've got our morning coffees, um, and we've sat down to get handover. Now, um, it would be useful if you have a, a pen and paper or an iPad and iPen um, or what, a mode, an instrument to, you know, use to take some notes because I think it'll be really useful to uh, take notes as we go along because that'll help you remember some of the things because that's, I'm going to throw a lot of information at you um, and uh, what we're doing is a bit of what we have to do on the board in the mornings uh, when we come in for handover as well so um, I'm going to go through all the patients I'm you know as, as if I was on the night I'm going to tell you about the patients I'm going to give you an update about them um, write down if you think anything's relevant or useful and we will circle back because we're going to then do the ward round and see our patients. So, you know, the information that you get that will be useful for, for that. Um, okay, so uh, what else to say? Um, we're, there's going to be a lot of uh, sort of things that we need to think about going forward. So I think it would be useful to, yeah, you know, jot, jot some stuff down. Okay, so, uh, well, welcome everyone to the morning handover. Um, it's been a busy night. Um, there, we have three patients on the ward um, and there's one patient I'm particularly concerned about that is Olu, our five month old. So I'll start with him. Um, Olu um, has had some, uh, he's come in with difficulty breathing and he's had a recent cold. Um, and we think he probably got it from his brother. His background is that he was born early. He was born at 30 weeks. Um, rather than 40 weeks and he stayed in hospital for 10 weeks and he needed a lot of breathing support in that time. Uh, he never had to be intubated which is where you put a tube down the throat and you breathe for the baby so he never had to be intubated which is a, one of the highest levels of um, respiratory so breathing support we can give a baby but he needed quite a lot of support and needed to be in hospital for 10 weeks. Um, we think that he has this condition called bronchiolitis, which is where your lungs uh, or his lungs, his airways are smaller than they should be in response to the cold and it's causing him to have difficulty getting oxygen in and carbon dioxide out. So difficulty with the gas exchange and therefore his breathing has become really, really labored and hard. Um, update overnight said he had a very difficult night. We had to review him multiple times um, because um, the nurses have been worried and so were the parents um, and his breathing isn't really improving and I think it's probably getting a bit worse um, and I think we really need to keep an eye on him um, as you as you go into today. Um, next we have uh, Arvi, um, he's four years old, um, he came in with redness and pain around the eye. It's very red and very swollen um, and he's been having a lot of fever at home. There's no other previous background with him. He's been previously well. Um, we think the working diagnosis is uh, something called preceptal cellulitis, which is an infection around the eye. Um, and this infection um, has caused him to uh, have the symptoms that he's having, and that's why he's come into hospital because of that. In terms of update, um, we think there's been some improvement overnight. Uh, on IV antibiotics, but his parents do say that he's been crying a lot more this morning. His temperature is high again just before we came into handover, so that's something to keep an eye on uh, today. Next, we have Megan. Uh, Megan's 13 years old. Um, she recently had, uh, she was recently sort of having a cold, similar to Olu, really. I think it's that time of year 
There are lots of kids who are unwell with some sort of flu viral symptoms. But she started with that, but then became really tired and vomiting and had headaches. Now, this is on a background of her already having diabetes. And we think our working diagnosis is di diabetic ketoacidosis, which is a diabetic crisis. And there's a severe lack of insulin. And this happens uh, because in diabetes, she doesn't make her own insulin, she injects her insulin. But when you're unwell, you need more insulin because your body's working much harder. And you need that insulin to try and get glucose into your cells. But because she was unwell, she wasn't able to, uh, you know, she, there was a mismatch between the amount of insulin she was giving and how much her body was needing, which ended up in this crisis. In terms of how she's doing, well, overnight, she's had no concerns. She's actually had breakfast this morning and returned back to her insulin regime. When she first came in, she needed a lot of IV intravenous antibiotics. So, uh, oh, sorry, not antibiotics, medication. So she needed, uh, I, she wasn't able to drink anything. So her, she had to have all her fluids via the drip, um, the IV medications. She also had to have her insulin via the drip. She had everything via the drip for a few days, but now she's returning back to normal. And actually she's had breakfast and she's had her usual insulin. Uh, we've stopped the IV medication. Now I know that was a lot of information. So we're going to go to our, oh, we're going to go to our Mentimeter and say, so, oh, hope it works. Who should we see first? Should we see RV, our four-year-old, Olu, our five-month-old, or Megan? What does everyone think? And the number count will give me a good idea of who's still listening. <laughs> We're coming a pretty good showing here for Olu. No one really going, no one really keen to go see RV first, or Megan, no. Very much, very much heading towards Alu, it seems. Yeah, okay. All right, I think uh, it sounds like we're, we're, uh, we're going to go see, oh, someone's gone for Avi. And that's, that's also fair. I mean, um, you know, really, I want to know why, why you're thinking what you're thinking. What's the... Why? Why do you want to go see Olu first? What's what? What about the handover about him as meant, you know, on our ward round, you think we should go see him first rather than Avi or, or Megan? Or see her, sorry, Olu. Breathing, nurse is concerned, has breathing issues. Uh, premature baby, previous admission to hospital. Yeah, these are all very good answers. Breathing difficulties and condition has worsened. What is the highest acuity patient? Most of risk of deteriorating, absolutely. Um, youngest was premature and affecting his health even more since he can't breathe. These are all really good answers. So I'm seeing that um, the key sort of features I'm pulling out of here is that you feel that we should go see him because his breathing isn't improving. Um, also, I'm getting a feeling that uh, people feel that because he is the youngest patient, um, so rather than the four-year-old or the 13-year-old, the uh, five-month-old is someone we should see because of that. A um, uh, few people have mentioned the prematurity, which is also fantastic. Um, that's really, really important. Um, and because it's a breathing problem, absolutely. Uh, and uh, his issues relating to the airway, yeah, absolutely. Perfect. And the nurses were concerned, definitely, 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 definitely. Um, and lots of really good responses here. Uh, and yes, all those conditions improving. Perfect. So I think those are the main responses that I'm um, getting. And I, someone here using the term vulnerable. He could be more vulnerable as he's still a baby and premature. Well, uh, who was born premature? Absolutely. So. There are lots of really good factors here, and I totally agree with that. And it's one of these decisions that we try and make even before the world round starts. Who do we start with and where do we go first? And, uh, you know, it's exactly the factors that you've identified that would help us decide what we should start with, you know, who we should start with. Because she is, um, Olu has had, um, I've changed gender here a few times, <laughs> uh, because Olu has had, difficulty breathing and it's a breathing problem um, which you know again there are different systems but it could deteriorate quite quickly 
Um, because the uh, because of Olu's prematurity um, and uh, because of the uh, the concerns um, that we have regarding uh, the sort of work, not non improvement, these are the things that have caused us to go. Okay, let's go see Olu first. So, what happens when we see Olu first? We go on the ward round. Uh, oh, we we've gone. Oh, uh, a couple of other things to think. So we talk, thought about who's sick, but we may also just have to decide, and particularly if it's very busy, so that's one of the things that we were sort of insinuating, but we'll come back to that. Who might be able to go home? And this could be something that we have to think about when it comes to you know, keeping patients in A&E safe. If you have lots of sick patients waiting up uh, in A&E who need a bed, you know, and there, aren't any, there isn't anyone who's super sick, then you might think, well, Maybe we should try and prioritize getting people out of hospital first. Um, or, you know, we might think actually, you know, there are some patients who need to be seen by other team, uh, other teams. And based on that, we might decide that we want to see them first so we can get the other teams to come see the patient before uh, the day gets too old. So those are other considerations that we could have. And that could change what we do um, for other patients. So we all decided Olu. Uh, is someone we need to see first. Um, Olu is already on high pressure breathing with prongs in her nose. She's having extra oxygen, usually, uh, and usually we breathe in air. That's 21% oxygen. She is on 35% oxygen, so a lot more oxygen than you would have in, in room air. She's looking tired, and her parents report that she's been really unsettled all night. Her observations show a high breathing rate, uh, but her saturation, so that's the blood oxygen level, which we'd expect to be above 92%, um, uh, or anywhere between 92 and 94, um, have been normal overnight. But she, but remember, she is needing oxygen to maintain, to maintain that. So what are the most concerning features Ooh, oh wait. of that? Of all the things I've said there, what are the most concerning features? Is it that she's already in high pressure support breathing? So what I mean by that is that um, we have uh, nasal cannulae, which go up the nose. I don't know if you've seen them. That's You can just give oxygen like that. But uh, for babies, we can give high pressure breathing support. So we give them uh, extra fast air to have try and help open up some of the lungs. Um, and that could really try and alleviate things that not need to progress. And so she's already on, on that and doesn't seem to be getting better, perhaps. Um, she, as I say, is on increased oxygen. Her breathing rate is fast and she's looking tired. I'm going to give a couple of, give you a couple of minutes because I know about, there's about, there are about 50 people responding. So in this uh, quiz thing, you have about, 100, I think it's about 100 points to allocate, isn't it? Something like that. And then you sort of decide how much you allocate to each of these specific domains, um, you know, how much, which of these things am I placing the most amount of, uh, uh, or giving the most weight to of all the options. And we're sort of settling. I think we have a few more people waiting to respond. So I will just wait for them to respond, but we're sort of settling on needing more oxygen and high pressure breathing support. Um, and looking tired, sort of on the lower end there. Let's see. Okay, I think it's time to stabilize. So I'm going to just go ahead. So uh, it was a bit of a trick question. I mean, ultimately, uh, but similar to what you did in terms of allocating points to the different domains, that's sort of how we do, do things in medicine. It, and different doctors may place different amount of uh, weight to these different factors based on their own experience. Now, me personally, um, I think looking tired um, in a baby who's been working really hard is actually m quite concerning. The high breathing rate, I might say, okay, you know, that that is important to be concerned about. However, we know he's going to have a, oh, she's going to have a high breathing rate. So, but looking tired, now that's something that means that perhaps she is just going to get tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter uh, and her breathing is going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. So that's something that I actually would place a little bit higher 
um, needing oxygen is quite common. So I, you know, and again, this is, this is something I'm saying with experience. So, you know, it's not something I'm expecting you to know, but it just goes to show that it's all about medicines, a lot about experience, a lot about um, prioritization, a lot about those sort of um, skills of uh, pattern recognition. Um, you often need more oxygen when you're, uh, when you have bronchitis in your bed well, but be already being on breath, breathing support, high pressure breathing support means that the next level up is going to be something where we need to get other teams involved. And, and we, when we'll, what we'll need to do is we'll need to talk to uh, uh, intensive care in a children's hospital to perhaps get Olu to uh, a place where they can give more support, like the tube down the throat, to give breathing support rather than the, the high pressure breathing support alone. If that makes sense. So um, that's one of the tasks that we may have to do, having seen Olu now, is we may need to contact the uh, intensive care team um, in a children's hospital um, and say to them, we have a patient who's really unwell and we need you to come see her and make a decision about if you think she needs to be transferred to you. Um, but you, when you make that decision, you know, uh, how soon you call, how late you call, these are all, uh, because do you think you might turn the corner? These are the decisions that we make on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so, so that one of the main, uh, wait, let me see if the next slide is about Olu. Yes, so what should we do next? I think I've sort of given the game away a little bit, but what sort of things do you think we should do next for Olu? to pick who oh gosh we have some have some medical students someone uh in the talk so speak to Piku. so uh yeah so Piku is pediatric intensive care unit update the parents so important and something that we often forget um is to update um, the parents about um what's going on um and review the treatment we're giving so far and blood gas is the type of blood test that we can do so transfer to icu or contact icu and make a referral absolutely um, transfer to another intensive care unit, speak to them. Yeah, check in with the nurse. Her nurse is about stats overnight. Perfect, absolutely. We should do that as part of the ward line, check the observations and everything um, going on so far. Uh, and we need to review, consider the high level of support and stuff. Perfect, good. Amazing, really, re this is fantastic stuff. Now, um, I, would, I do want to keep reading these, but I am going to move on because we. I want to get through a couple of other patients before we get to Q&A, uh, if we can. Um, we might skip the last patient just because, in the interest of time uh, because you're all answering such, you know, you're giving me so much to talk about. So we now go to see Arby on the water next. I've decided that, you know, next up is Arby. Um, uh, so I hope you wrote down what uh, Arby's situation was, which is that he had an infection around the eye. So Arby's parents report that he's crying more. Uh, they think he is in pain. Um, and you notice this, that this ha really happens when he's looking around. He's at a high temperature, which came down with paracetamol. And the doctor who saw Arby yesterday is on the ward ramp and reports that his eyes do seem the same as yesterday. Arby doesn't want to interact with this at all. Uh, but after you gained his trust, he reports that his uh, eye is ouchy. Now, this is quite a common sort of situation on, uh, in pediatrics, not necessarily the, eye, uh, the infection around the eye, but the uh, situation of um, a child not wanting to interact with us. So very quickly, what we're going to do is think about this next question, which is, what can we do to get Arby to interact with us? What sort of things can we do to get him to uh, have a conversation with us, get him on our side? What can we do? Find out what his interests are. Toys, perfect. Speak about something other than medicine, absolutely. I mean, he's four, he's not really going to know anything about medicine. Um, gain trust by finding things he's interested in, absolutely. And you know, I think some people think four-year-olds don't have interest, but they do. It, it, and it could be, um, a TV show, or it could be some sort of card thing that they're interested in. Favorite dinosaur, very good. That's uh, that's the uh, 
name of the game here. Uh, tell jokes. Yeah, kids do love jokes. But at four, you know, they may be, um, I think sort of fart jokes and things do sort of land sometimes. Um, play a small game. Absolutely talk about friends, school, use picture scales. Uh, have, have a conversation with parents, finds interest. Absolutely. Uh, involve play therapists. Great. So that's another whole uh, thing that in pediatrics that we have that we don't find anywhere else. Uh, people who are paid to play. Uh, and it's it's really quite amazing uh, and but they can really help in terms of getting children to interact with us talking about tv play perfect these are absolutely the right things smile uh, yeah definitely um, and trying to be talking in an approachable way yes absolutely so talking approachably uh, not using confusing words um, and putting them at, e at ease giving them toys to cuddle perfect uh and that's exactly what we need to do in Belarus. And now I really want you to think all these things that you've said, all those things, what skills are those that we're using? What skills do we need in medicine? Um, uh, and in particular pediatrics, but this can, you know, you can sort of uh, extend it to the whole of medicine. But what skills are we using? Um, and why are they important? Why is that more important than, say, um, uh, uh, other jobs and that all the skills that we're using um, are more important in medicine than in some other jobs, you know? Communication, absolutely. Perfect, good. So, uh, and I want you to think not just about the communication skills that we're using, but, you know, how are we using them? What, what are we doing um, that is helping here? You know, everyone needs some level of communication skills to go about day-to-day -day, uh, business, but what are we doing here in medicine that makes it different and that's one of the things that you know if you're applying for medical school that you know uh, that would be useful to talk about in interviews um okay really quickly uh, next up we're going to ask are there other teams that we should contact for rb are there other medical teams surgical teams anyone that we should contact oh perfect Lovely, yes. Getting a lot of ophthalmology here. I did this to Word Cloud because I didn't know uh, what was the best format, but it looks like Word Cloud's doing pretty well here and ophthalmology is coming out as the, as the clear winner. Yes, definitely. Agreed. Ophthalmology, some people have the optometry, that's definitely, you know, may need that in the future. We all should have our eye checks with optometrists, but um, ophthalmology are the main people. I'm looking at other things, histology, immunology, I mean, uh, if we take any samples of something, we may need to send it to the pathology team. Great, good. Uh, you're all fantastic there, yeah, absolutely. Um, ophthalmology is the, is the way forward. So that's the eye doctors for those uh, who haven't heard of ophthalmology before. So that's the eye doctors. And that's because he said his eyes ouchy. Um, I, and because we noticed it when he was looking around, if if it's around the eye, it shouldn't hurt when you're looking at things. Um, but if you look somewhere and it hurts, then you're worried that the infection may have spread to the eye. Okay, great. Um, we'll move on. So now we go to see Megan, and she's feeling a lot better today. She's had, she says, she's had di diabetic ketoacidosis (DKA) before, and the last time it was triggered by an illness too. Um, she's managed to eat and has restarted her usual insulin and has had some blood tests before the ward round. Um, I've got some statements here on Mentimeter that I want you to decide if you agree with them. So, uh, do you agree with these statements? We should discharge her. She should stay another night in hospital. We should contact the diabetes team. We should talk to Megan about her di diabetes control. And we need to investigate further why she had this crisis. So this will be a slider. You just uh, move the slider till you have a... Uh, are you, are you happy with your answer? And then it will average out everyone's sliders to where we get. Great. This is... So I'm getting a sense that generally people think we should contact the diabetes team. We should talk to Di Megan about the diabetes control. And we should uh, think about maybe discharging her. And if a lot of people here, actually, I'm seeing two bounces there about investigating further why she had this crisis. Um, and a, a, a pretty good support for she to stay one more night in hospital there. So I'll tell you my my view is that I think we should discharge. I think we should definitely contact the diabetes team. Um, and I hope you're taking some of these jobs down. I should have said that at the beginning, perhaps. But um, So we should contact the diabetes team. 
uh, I, I do agree that it might be useful to talk to Megan about diabetes control. You know, when I was making this earlier, I was thinking she says that she's had it before, but actually we should figure out sort of, you know, the, we do give children with diabetes a plan for when they get unwell to follow so that this doesn't happen. So there would be perhaps something to check in on here to say, you know, should we, should we talk about your diabetes control? You know, are you, you, do you understand your sick day rules, rules for when you're sick and what to do about it? Um, I don't know if we need to investigate this crisis further. I think that's probably lower down because I think it was clear. It sounds like she was unwell with some sort of flu-like illness or something. So, um, yeah, perfect. So, that, but as you can see, a lot of medicine is sort of a slider in your head where you're sort of saying, should we keep her? Should we stay? Should we stay another night? What should we do? And absolutely, based on these information, because if you know, if you thought her diabetes control was very bad, you might that would change what in you know your discharge and one more night in the hospital slider in your in your head. If you see what I mean. Um, and that is a skill of prioritization. That's a skill of um, of taking information, processing it, and, and, and making something of it. Good. Next question. What jobs have we created? Now, a job is a task that we need to carry out. Hopefully, you've been keeping track. I didn't say that at the beginning, but I'm hoping you all seem very switched on here looking at the answers. So hopefully, you've been keeping track. But what jobs have we created? We put a little Mentimeter thing here um, for, for that. Let's see what you uh, let's see what you think. Oh, and I mean for the whole ward, I'm sorry. It's not just Megan, but the whole yes, contact IT team. Yeah, absolutely. Something we discussed about for Megan. And as you can see, you can enter multiple things. So I try and do one per option that you can enter. Uh, referrals, referrals, ophthalmology, ICU, diabetes. Anyone related to managing the distribution of beds? Yeah, perhaps that's true. Uh, PICU, yeah, we're seeing lots and lots of different things here. Great, 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 great. Good. Checking up pain levels of ophthalmologists, informing parents. Good. And you're saying all the same sorts of things that... Uh, keep checks on Megan, refer RV, prioritization, diabetes team. Lovely. Good. Lots of, lots of, diff, you know, all sorts of jobs that I thought of here. And in fact, here is a great little Mentimeter thing where we're going to rank. And I totally agree with all those jobs you've said. I really, I'm sorry if I cut you off a bit, but I do want to try and get through um, all the things. But let's prioritize. Now, this is a ranking tool. I want you to rank which jobs do you think come first, second, all the way down to eighth of those jobs that we have? And I'm just curious to see, and it averages you all out again, of course, but I'm curious to see what, um, how you would prioritize the list, this list of jobs. Um, and you'll see some uh, uh, extra jobs that I, I have made up in there as well. So that's, uh, um, well, a coffee break, um, and also reviewing a patient waiting in A&E. Perfect. And I also I decided um, of not just ophthalmology, but ear, nose, and throat as well, because they, and, and this is not something you would know, but it's they deal with around the eye stuff, whereas uh, ophthalmology deal with just eye stuff. So um, great, right, discharge summary. And a discharge summary being a, a letter you need to have before you leave hospital. Not, not necessarily need, but it's a letter to have before you leave hospital to say what's happened um, and uh, what we've done. And so the GP can know what's what's been going on or in case you come back into hospital. Okay, I'm going to, I know that there's been, uh, it's about 50, 50 people responding. So I might just give this another moment, even though I would like to move on, but I'm going to give you all a chance to have your say, to see, because there's a little bit of a battle between third and fourth here. I'm curious to see where that will play out. Um... Interesting. Perfect. Okay. Cool. So what we're seeing here is that people feel the most important thing we need to do is discuss OLU with the intensive care team. Absolutely. Um, and then referring RV to ophthalmology team. Um, 
then we've got diabetes team reviewing a patient a &E, referring RB2 to your nose and throat, chasing Megan's blood results, writing the discharge summary and coffee break. Now, absolutely. I mean, I think that's sort of what would happen on this day, but it all depends on what sort of day it's been. I mean, if it's been really busy from the very outset and you finish the ward round quite late, there is a real, real case to make for having a coffee break first because there is no chance of you being able to do your jobs well if uh, you, you can't think straight because you're so tired. And so based on the day, based on how things are going, based on the acuity of the patients, acuity being how sick um, they are and how much, um, how much input a patient needs, based on that, you might change the, the priority list would be different. Um, and that includes things like coffee breaks and lunches. Um, and discharge summaries even, you know, if it's a re if there are, as I say, some patients really sick in A&E and we need flow, that might become a little bit more important than some of the other jobs. Um, or if there's a crucial blood test you're waiting on for a patient to make a decision about if they're going to surgery or if they're going to another hospital or whatever, then that may become the priority to do. So, but I, I totally agree with you. We're, we've ranked it in terms of sort of relative acuity at, at the moment. Um, now, I'll shoot through this quickly. Different skills we need pediatrics, different skills. Uh, I'll just talk a, a little bit about the fact that, uh, you know, there are skills that we need in medicine in general, and I'm just picking out a few that we need in pediatrics because, you know, we have, and, and really I'm trying to say here that I'm not giving you the skills. I want you to think about it yourself, about how how are skills that need to be a bit different in pediatrics because we deal with babies who can't tell us what they are feeling we need to use our ears and our eyes and our, um, our clinical acumen um, and our interpretation blood tests and things to best inform us about babies because they can't just say i'm not feeling well today which a 13 year old can do parents know them best and you know we need to think about how that changes what communication um, we have with parents parents know their children really really well however they also um probably only know their children and what we do in pediatrics is lots of children so then we have this ability to be able to reassure them if it's something that we see a lot or if it's if it's something that you know is is new or something that we need to worry about then we can carry you know do the right thing for that for that baby um but we need to be able to listen to parents and you know it's about how we have that interaction particularly when you've just had a newborn it, it's a very stressful time as well as an amazing time. So how do we interact with people in, in that scenario? And babies wriggle a lot. So, you know, and if I, if any of you went to have your blood test done and someone said hold still, almost certainly you'd hold still. Babies won't do that. It changes what skills I need to have to be able to deal with that. As you grow older, children, they can communicate. And this is where the name for the talk comes from. You mainly talk about things like TV shows or favorite dinosaurs, which we sort of alluded to when we were talking about Arby there. Um, to try and get them on site, to try and talk to them. And that's because if they can be frustrated when they're talked over. Even at the age of four or five, children have thoughts and it's important for us to hear them. But it's also important for us to, you know, focus on what the parents are saying. So it's this three-way communication that we really need to figure out well, and particularly as you go on to, you know, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds, 10-year-olds. And it can be, uh, and they can be scared of being in a medical setting. You know, it's about how we interact with kids in that situation. Now, teenagers are a whole another kettle of fish. I don't know if some of you, um, or pro presumably quite a few of you, are still teenagers, but um, and it's this time of life where you're trying to figure out, you know, what you want to do in life. And um, I mean, I think we all are to some extent, but particularly, you feel it particularly a lot uh, in teenage years. You want agency about making decisions, and they may want. Um, varying levels of how much they want parents to know and also how much they want to be involved in their own healthcare and start trying to get that balance right. How much do parents do? How much do the teenagers do? I mean, particularly if you're, if you're at school the whole day, it's not like where a toddler who's at home the whole day in terms of who gives the medications, that can get tricky um, and about how we deal with that. And that can be a highly emotional time and, and also a highly, there's lots of social things going on things about drinks, drinking, drugs, social media, these are all important topics that we need to talk to teenagers about, that we don't necessarily need to talk to babies about. Or, you know, you can do, but not going to be that helpful usually. So 
but having all of those skills is something that we need to do in pediatrics. Now, I haven't given you what the skills are, well. I'd li- but I'd like you to reflect on it. Think, you know, what do doctors in pediatrics need to do differently? Um, and how does that tell me about the skills you need as a doctor in general? So I've rattled through quite a bit, but what have we covered? We've talked about some common problems in pediatrics. We've talked about what ward rounds are and what we do on them and how we approach the information we receive on ward rounds. But now there's a lot more that goes on, a lot more about blood tests and um, a lot more about, uh, you know, imaging information. There's a lot of information you go through on ward rounds that we didn't and I, because I don't want to overcomplicate it for you. Um, and uh, we talked about the specific skills that are important in pediatrics, or rather I asked, I, I sort of alluded to them. And that's because I wanted to give you an insight into the work of a doctor. And I really want you to reflect on these things you've learned today. Um, If you're applying for medicine, particularly to use it to, um, you know, help you decide on the sort of things that you want to talk about uh, when when it comes to interviews. and the things that you might want to include as important skills. And I really want you to reflect on the skills that we've talked about and the skills that we've seen on the wall around, the things that might, you might need to do, things like prioritization, um, things like, uh, you know, commun- I mean, we talked a lot about communication, but, you know, it includes other skills, you know, you have um, organization, time skills, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and I want you to really think about how this relates to your skill. And if you're a medical student watching or anyone, you know, about how it informs which specialty you decide to do as well. Um, so even if, if you're applying for medical school, once you've gone to medical school, then you have to decide which way you want to go. And these are the things to reflect on to get, get to that point. So any questions? Now, one more thing I should say is that, you know, I made it seem like we would... This is how war runs always happen, which is that you have a whole team, you go around together. Um, but in reality, when we have those jobs, a lot of those jobs would be happening together. Um, you might you might even do the job as you go. If there are lots of you on the ward round, one of you could peel off to do jobs while you know the rest of you go on and document those, uh, you know, what's going on and summarizing things. So one person go off to do referrals, one person can do, go off to do look at blood tests. Um, and all of that. So it, these things happen in conjunction. And also, um, you can split the ward runs. So you can have two ward runs happening. So two two patients can be being seen at the same time. Uh, one with the consultant, one with the registrar. You know that sort of stuff. So there, I've given you quite a, a narrow spectrum of what happens, but it's just to give you an early indication to to these things. Um, so I hope that's I hope that's been useful. Um, and I think there's quite a few questions already. Um, shall I just start on them, Zach? Yes, yeah, yeah, if you want to. We've got about five minutes or so for questions. That so I'll fab. try and shoot through them. What do nurses in charge mainly do? I've been talking about it already. What is the difference between matrons on the, ward, ward, uh, on the ward and nurses in charge? Matrons are sort of the overall in charge of the ward in many different ways. So future planning and all of that. Um, nurse in charge is in charge on that day and doing dealing with you know the patient flow and um, nurses on that day so they may be the senior nurse who goes to help out with things if they need whatever you know any help they need um do you get to choose which patient has to be seen first you know invariably we will have a discussion in the morning about who you know which patient is going to be seen generally the consultant or registrar will make that decision about where we start um if you're a more junior member um but if you're sometimes in some places i've had to do my own ward runs and then i would decide which patients i saw first why did you choose to become a pediatrician? Great question. And it's exactly the things we talked about today. I mean, I really loved working with kids. I really loved the fact that, you know, I need to know things like Paw Patrol and Moana and Kanto, all of these things as part of my working day. Um, and I still got to do medicine. I still got to do interesting procedures, um, you know, chat to patients, you know, do a lot of uh, all the medical stuff that I would do in adult medicine. But at the same time, I need to do it in a way where I wasn't scaring kids and was able to um, enjoy having fun on my work day, which, you know, I, I felt for myself that was something that I didn't get in other parts of medicine. What's the most difficult part of the job, particularly to pediatrics? 
I mean, it, it can be incredibly tough and incredibly difficult. Um, I think the, uh, me and my colleagues talk about this quite a bit. I, uh, and essentially the highs are higher and the lows are lower, I think, compared to other parts of medicine. The general working day is really lovely. Also, it's, a, it's invariably a terrible rotor. So, you know, you're working an awful lot. You're doing, a, um, it, it, you know, uh, they really, really work as hard in pediatrics. Um, and uh, so I wouldn't, uh, and something I say to all medical students come to us, if, if, particularly if someone says, I'm interested in pediatrics, I say, I, you know, absolutely. But I just want you to realize that it is an incredibly difficult life at times. So, you know, I, I want you to know that you're making that, choice willingly uh, how do doctors healthcare professionals adapt to winter flu lack of beds oh so that's a big question i don't think we really adapt to that well to be honest yeah that's why winters are quite hard i'm sorry i can't give you a better answer than that it's, it's a big question we could do the whole talk by itself medical students going to start my pediatric petition what's the best way to learn on ward ranks oh great question um be engaged be able to take on some of the jobs, offer to take on some of the jobs, uh, particularly jobs where you can be supervised. I think that's a great way to learn. Um, resources are particularly helpful. I, I think just, just being there and just trying to see what's happening and, and, and asking why. Why are they doing? Why are they making the decisions they're making? Uh, do you think being at a new medical school with not much of a reputation holds you back? No, not at all. Uh, I, you know, when I started BSMS, it had only uh, been open for 10 years. Uh, and it meant that they had so much flexibility. They listened to everything we said. It wasn't in its old ways of, you know, this is how we do things. It was very much, tell me how we can improve. And I thought that was amazing. So I loved being at a newer medical school. So I would, at the, always, at the drop of a hat, um, I, would, I would never say it holds you back. Memorable case of the pediatrician uh, and rewarding part of the job. Oh, that's, those are difficult questions. But I think when patients remember me, particularly, you know, I think it's a really difficult time for kids. And as adults, I think we remember things more, but um, it, uh, if it's a child who remembers care that I've given, I, I, you know, that's, that's amazing. And one child made me uh, a little friendship bracelet, which I've still kept to this day. So I think it's probably been a memorable case and rewarding part of the job. How did you find BSMS? Uh, I don't know if you mean found it or uh, how I found being at BSMS, but I absolutely loved it. It was an incredible medical school. There's lots of resources on the BSMS website. Um, and I'm sure Zach could um, uh, point you towards that as well. Um, that uh, um, can show you what a day in the life of being BSMS is like. And I, I just had an amazing time um, at BSMS. What are the usual complaints and issues you get from pediatric patients and their parents? How are the different uh, complaints and other issues? Uh, I think, I mean, again, this is a really big one. So I think uh, that's something that you may have to look into yourself. I'm sorry, but essentially because it's kids, there is a whole different range of problems kids get than adults get. So that it, by the very nature of it changes um, uh, what issues and things that we deal with. What are the most challenging aspects of work at pediatrics? I think sort of answer that. What is my favorite dance? So thank you for asking. It is, of course, a triceratops. I'll start with how do you balance your outside interest in studying a degree? And I think it also uh, pertains to, you know, how do you, how do we balance it with being a doctor? It is incredibly hard. Degree wise, it can be easier um, because you have more time that is your own um, outside of lectures that you can, um, you know, use. Um, so I think uh, it's about being regimented a bit and saying, you know, if you're allocating time to, uh, do work you should also allocate time to have fun um, so you know uh, not being so you know work 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 I'll, I'll have fun if I can no it, it, that needs to be part of your schedule so you know am I going to hockey am I going to go play tennis am I picking you know learning a new language these things are coded into my day as much as um, work is um, and then uh, and someone sort of said, do I have time for my hobbies? At the moment, it's become, it, it's been quite difficult, but because of my current specific job, which is very intense, but in general, I have. But the other question I want to ask, answer was um, something about grades and getting into um, medical school. And I'm sure you can answer that better, Zach. But what the main thing I want to say is that hopefully 
my talk today has shown to you that the key thing you need to be a doctor, a good doctor, is not, it's not about your grades. Those grades are just to get your foot in the door in terms of, you know, so we can select for, it's, a rig, it's an academically very rigorous course. It is challenging. The, the difference between us and other um, uh, healthcare professionals or uh, certain healthcare professionals um, is that, you know, there's a lot of sort of academic rigor as part of medicine. Um, and the grades are mainly there to do that. But really, the key thing we're selecting on, and I think particularly, you know, I know that we do at BSMS, but at all medical schools, especially with MMIs, it are these skills that we've talked about today is things like team working, because I want you to be able to I work on my team. I need you to be able to organize, you know, your time when you come to join me on a walk. I need you to be... Um, I need you to be interactive and fun if you're coming to pediatrics, but, you know, interactive and um, communicative and hardworking. And, you know, these are the things that I care more about you being as a doctor than incredibly smart. Um, and that's because a parent's not going to remember an incredibly smart doctor, but they will remember one who makes them feel bad. But they, and they will also always remember one who made them feel good when they've had a baby and it's been a tough time. Or, or a good time and you've been there to be part of that journey. So that's what we're selecting on. Don't worry too much about the grades. In which case, um, the last thing to say is a, is a massive thank you uh, to Dr. Manny Jai Murthy. Uh, thank you so much. It was a really excellent talk uh, this evening. Um, thank you so much for attending, uh, especially at the very start of a new year. This is a great way uh, to start start our new year of talks. Uh, we do hope to see you in, uh, in a future lecture as well. Um, so thanks very much, folks. You can now um, head on, head on out. Enjoy the rest of your evenings. <laughs>